Uh, just a little bit of background before we, we go into this. So for one year here, actually starting in last November, we've been in the book of John, John's gospel, uh, when I preach, and we're in, we've just finished John chapter 8. And so the next, the, these few weeks in December, we've been looking at, we, we've stepped out of John, but not really, because we stepped into what I often call, and commentators will often call, the, the, the fifth gospel, the book of Isaiah, where the prophecies of the coming Messiah are given in such vivid detail that his, his life and work come alive. And we've seen how the book of Isaiah connects so perfectly in John's gospel. It shouldn't surprise us. Isaiah is the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. But just to remind you, so in John chapter 8, we saw where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That was John 8. So a couple weeks ago, we looked at Isaiah 49, where God says to his servant, who would be Jesus Christ, it's too light a thing for you to just rescue and bring back the people of Israel. I'm going to make you as a light to the nations to bring the people to me so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Or you may remember in, in John 7 and all these arguments Jesus is having with the religious leaders where he says, do not judge by appearances, but judge by right judgment. As we saw in Isaiah 11, where it says about Jesus, he shall not judge by what his eyes see or despite disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness shall he judge. And so we see how Jesus Christ embodies, and John's gospel shows he embodies all the prophecies of what we should look like, how we should act. Today is just another beautiful passage. So you think back to John 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And what do we hear in today's prophecy? When I read it, you'll hear it. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall call his name Emmanuel. Which Matthew's gospel tells us means God with us. So that's going to be the major theme. Would you listen with me and read with me even, if you have it? Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7, it's a obscure text with an amazing prophecy in the middle of it. That's what we're going to look at. This is the word of the Lord. Isaiah 7. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool of the highway to the washer's field, and say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands, at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Ramalia, because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Ramalia has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, it shall not come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin, and within 65 years Ephraim will be shattered from being a people, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. 
Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse evil and choose the good, the land who the two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and your people and upon your father's house such days have not come since the day of Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I know that's a long 17 verses with lots of names and places and oddities to get to this idea that the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. So we will look at that. I hope you were able to hear in there and and see in there this King Ahaz, this faithless king, and I'm going to tell you more about him. But as I was reading this text, and as I explain the text, hopefully it makes sense, but as I was reading it, I just was remembering a, a friend of mine in college, very close friend. I haven't uh, spoken to him in over 20 years because he lives in Europe, and it's just harder to communicate. And so, But he was like my best friend. He was from Spain, such a giving guy, a generous guy. But religious was the furthest, uh, religion and spirituality and God was the furthest thing away from him. And I remember his whole life was collapsing around him, everything. His family in Spain, I, I, I don't remember all the details, but there was some illness maybe among his, about his parents that was life-threatening. Something was going on with his visa to allow him to stay in the country, and he was having trouble with the school, and all this was happening at once. And I remember going to him, and it's kind of ironic because I wasn't walking with the Lord, But I went to him and I said, well, have you considered prayer? Have you turned to God? And I've told you this before, but and he said, it was just heartbreaking. He said, it hasn't come to that yet. And I thought, man, what what would have to happen to you for it to come to that? Your whole life is being threatened right now. You may end up not being able to finish your degree here. Something's going on with a parent. I mean, and... I was really saddened by that. But what I've come to learn years and years later is that I was really no better than him. For him, God was a last resort. But for me, he was a genie in a bottle. And really, I just kind of expected God in my life to like stay out of my way and actually clear the way for me. So foresee illness and trial and struggle and just clear it out of my way so I can live my best life now. And it's like, that's really no different than how this guy was living. In some cases, it's worse. There's a song on the radio right now, and um, it's got some coarse language, but the the honesty and the insight of this song is, is how Christians Christians even, live today. I'm not going to, of course, say the coarse language. But the the song is, I need a favor. I only talk to God when I need a favor. And I only pray when I ain't got a prayer. So who am I to expect a savior if I only talk to God when I need a favor? But God, I need a favor. And I think most of us live like that. Whether you're like my friend and he's just a last resort, or if anything, struggle comes in your life, you just go to God, but you're not walking with him. Or you were like me and you just expected God to clear the way for you no matter what. None of that depicts relationship. None of that, I mean, like, can you imagine if you had a friend like that? Or a spouse like that? And yet that's how we approach God. Our text today expresses God's heart against that mindset. Yet, despite our lack of desire for for relationship with him and for pursuit of him and for including him in our life, he is in relentless pursuit of us. Our text foretells the virgin birth, and that verse is the verse I'm really going to camp on. Verse 
uh, 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And the points in your worship programs, your bulletins, really center on the virgin birth. But before I get to those, I'm going to give you the background on this odd story. And this is, this is how preachers tell you they're going to give you three points, but they add other points in. So I'll give you the background first. Ahaz was the king of Judah at a time when there's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And a lot of people I know that Israel's history is complicated. It was one kingdom under David and Solomon, but because of Solomon's faithlessness in his sons, the kingdom splits. And the northern kingdom is called Israel and the southern kingdom is called Judah. And that's why you often read in the Old Testament where Israel is coming against Judah. And you're like, I thought they were one. They're, they're like, it was like a civil war. There's two separate nations. Judah is where Jerusalem and the temple were. And it was much smaller than Israel. And Israel is often referred to and called Samaria because Samaria was a part of this part of, of the region. So I give you all that detail to tell you that Ahaz was a faithless, worthless, wicked king in Judah, where the temple was. And Israel and Syria, which were smaller nations as as far as like geopolitical powers, they joined forces against Judah. And Ahaz and Israel are scared. And so what Ahaz does, rather than turn to God is he turns to the large empire of Assyria, which is different than Syria. And so rather than turn to God, because it hasn't gotten to that point yet, he turns to a ruthless, wicked king. And God comes to him by the prophet Isaiah, which is so merciful. Let me, let me tell you how wicked Ahaz was. I'm going to read from 2 Chronicles 28. This is the king that God is speaking to. You can also find Ahaz in the book of uh, 2 Kings, 1 Kings or 2 Kings 16, but we're in 2 Chronicles 28. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he ran 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and his father, and as his father David had done. But he walked, so he's in the line of David but he's walking wickedly. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, which again, that's the northern people. He even made metal images of the Baals, and he made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burned his sons as an offering. Like you think child sacrifice is like an imagination. Child sacrifice was a real thing. And this king that is supposed to be in the line of David actually sacrificed his own children. He probably didn't even care. He probably had dozens of wives. And so he sacrificed a few of the kids. According to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel, and he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Therefore the Lord his God gave him into the hand of the king of Assyria, who defeated him and took captive a great number of his people. So verse 16 of Second Chronicles 28 says, At that time King Ahaz sent to the king of Assyria for help. Verse 19, for the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, king of Israel, for he had made Judah act sinfully and been very unfaithful to the Lord. So the king of Assyria came against him and afflicted him instead of strengthening him. So he turned to an ally to save him, and this king of Assyria turned on him. Verse 22, in the time of his distress, King Ahaz, he became yet more faithless to the Lord, this same king Ahaz. When you read that whole chapter, you just, the wicked, you're like this, like what would you think God should do to that man sitting on the throne of his people to give his people grace, to lead them in righteousness, to fight for the poor and the widows? What do you think God should do to that wicked man? You know what our God did? Verse 4, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, 
And do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps. See, Ahaz, God may, may be a distant thought in Ahaz's mind, but God is faithful to his people. And God does not cast his people off. And you heard about Ahaz's faithlessness. Verse 9, if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. But he's shaken in his boots. And yet, God says, ask a sign. You wicked, child-sacrificing, adulterous king. Ask for me a sign. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as the heavens. Ask. Ahaz says, well, I'm not going to ask. And he, he almost kind of tries to sound pious. Oh, I'm not going to put you to the test, Lord. And God says back to him with humor and sarcasm, you, you weary everybody else. Now you're wearying me. But I'm going to give you a sign anyway. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And we learn that in the Hebrew they would understand that means God with us. And in Matthew's gospel it explains that. The, the irony in this prophecy is Syria and Israel don't conquer Judah, but Assyria does. See, God uses the, 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 the self-saving technique of Ahaz to go bring in another savior to conquer Ahaz. So I don't know why this is considered such a good sign, but I think the point is, you faithless king, this sign I'm going to give you, you're really not going to see it. But I'm faithful to my people, and one day they will see it. And so to get to kind of the, the virgin birth aspect of this, that, that's the context and the story. The virgin birth, the virgin shall conceive. This doctrine, which Matthew's gospel tells us, uh, I can go to it. Matthew 1.18, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So clearly, that is a virgin birth. <laughs> and her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So, so the angel tells him, name him Jesus, Joshua, Yeshua, which means the Lord saves. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Man Emmanuel. And then Matthew tells his readers, who might not be Jewish, which means God with us. And so you get this beautiful combination of names. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. There's not a contradiction there. The writer's not stupid that in two sentences he's going to change his mind. The point is his name is Jesus, Yeshua. But when people look at him, particularly after the cross, they will say, God, he is, God is with us. This is what John's gospel teaches. And the word was God, and the word became flesh, a man, and dwelt among us. This doctrine of the virgin birth is the most, most attacked doctrine in Christology, the study of Jesus Christ, and so in Christianity out of all the doctrines. It's odd to me because Jesus walked on water, he healed crippled people, he rose from the dead, but they want to attack the virgin birth specifically because virgins don't have babies. And I don't know about you, but the last time I looked, I couldn't walk on water either. It seems like if critics can attack the origin story, the whole thing comes down like a house of cards. And that's why with evolution 
and creation, that, that is the attack of science on the Bible, because then everything else just falls apart. And if you can attack the virgin birth and say Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, every other doctrine then can fall like a house of cards. And that's exactly what was happening in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s into the mid-1900s with liberalism, not political liberalism, but liberalism in theology. This is where fundamentalists come from. So you've heard of fundamentalists, and that's a bad word. Well, the reason fundamentalists came about, it's not a bad word. Some of you are looking at me funny. But the culture treats it like it's a bad word. So the liberalists in the Presbyterian church, they ordained men who did not believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, did not believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, did not believe in the penal substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ, did not believe in the miracles of Jesus Christ, and did not believe the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. These were Presbyterian pastors. And men like J. Gresham Machen stood up and said no. And so those five doctrines that were under attack became known as the five fundamentals. The virgin birth, the inerrancy of Scripture, the bodily resurrection of Christ, the penal substitution of Christ, and the miracles of Jesus Christ. That in order to, for one to be an orthodox Christian, they must believe those five things. Machen wrote Lib- uh, Christianity and Liberalism. See, what, what, what liberal scholars were trying to do was demythologize the Bible. That's, that, was the, that was the program. We need to cure this book of the superstition. Because what it's... See, everything's just an analogy, they thought. So we're going to take out the miracles and take out the supernatural because there's other spiritual truths in there. And I don't know how you can have spiritual truths if you have no spirit, the supernatural. And that's the point. So they would take a passage like Jesus would say, don't you have eyes to see and ears to hear? And they would say, see, we need spiritual insight. And what we want to say is, yeah, but right when Jesus says that, he healed an actual blind person and an actual deaf person to say, I'm the one who gives the sight and the hearing. And so this was the controversy. This was the attack. And as I said, of all the miracles of Jesus Christ, to me, the, the least hard to believe is the virgin birth. I just, I don't understand. If he could walk on water and get raised from the dead, and if God created everything by the word of his power, the idea that he can't make a young lady have, uh, be pregnant, that, like, is that so far-fetched? So the question comes up, oh, by the way, too, I wanted to make this connection in, John, in John's gospel. I got it a little ahead of myself. I think in John's gospel, there's a little hint that they understood that Mary was pregnant in weird circumstances. We are, I already read to you that they, 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 Joseph was like, wait a minute, this, she must have committed adultery because that's not, we haven't been together. And the angel clearly tells them, no, no, this, she was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The angel tells Mary that same thing. So the Bible teaches the virgin birth. In John 8, there's, there's some interesting verses. In, uh, starting in John 6, they say, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? So they know where he comes from comes from Nazareth and Galilee. They mock him for it. They know that his earthly parents are. Mary and Joseph, and we don't know that these are the same people, but the same arguments and same fights happen, and they would know, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, want to know who he is. They would know who his earthly parents are. This is what they say in John 8, 19. They said to him, where is your father? Because Jesus is talking about his father. He's talking about God in heaven, right? He says, well, where is he? Later, they say in John 8, 41, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Now, why would they say that? What, what possible sense would that mean? <laughs> For them to tell him, we were not born in sexual immorality, he wasn't insinuating they were. It's almost like a dig 
In John 8, 48, the Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Why would they say that? We heard about that birth story. You don't know who your real father is. Was he a Samaritan? Anyhow, that's what many commentators think and believe, like, that's what's going on in John's gospel. It is true in the Isaiah passage that the, the word that's translated virgin in Matthew's gospel is, is, is the young girl in the text I read you. And I don't know, people make a big deal of that. I don't know why. When the Jews translated Isaiah, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, when they translated Isaiah from Hebrew into Greek, the Jews themselves, they translated that word as virgin. And then Matthew tells you virgin, but the Bible clearly teaches the virgin birth. The question is not, does the Bible teach the virgin birth? When people say that, they're, I'm sorry, I'm trying to stop. They, they're saying that in ignorance. The, I already read, the Bible teaches that the, the virgin birth. The question is, is it real? Is it real? And that's where faith comes in. And I think that's why in, in this weird prophecy, in the midst of a war and all this, if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. And Ahaz won't even ask a sign. And so the Lord gives him an incredible sign, an unbelievable sign that even to today people will not believe. So the question is, can you be a Christian and not believe the virgin birth? Let me word it a different way. You, you can actually absolutely be saved and not believe the virgin birth. Because we're not saved based on our right belief of Christian doctrine. We're saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ that is applied to us. There are people that don't know the doctrines. There have been people in history that had no idea that was the story. But as Christians... When you are presented with the word of God and the word of God tells you it's a virgin birth, you are in disobedience and rebellion when you don't believe that. Okay? I hope you're understanding the distinction I'm making. We are not going to be judged on every little doctrine that we don't know. But when you are presented with right doctrine and Christians have a responsibility, Jesus says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I've commanded you. Once you have the knowledge, you are responsible for it. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. I hope you understand that distinction. If I bothered you by that statement, let me know. The people that are saying there's no virgin birth have the information that Scripture says there's a virgin birth, and they will be held accountable to that. And I believe, by the way, that goes for anything the Bible is clear on. Not just doctrine. Not just the fact that Jesus died for our sins, penal substitutionary atonement. Not just that he was born of a virgin. I mean, the early church viewed that as so important. It was a part of the Apostles' Creed, right? Born of the virgin. <laughs> But how we view the ethics in the Bible, what is right and wrong, when the Bible is clear on those things, we are in rebellion against the word of God, and at some point we have a right to ask, are you actually a Christian? The Bible is clear on marriage. The Bible is clear on human sexuality. The Bible is clear on headship. The Bible is clear on how we're to treat people. These things are not in question. When you make them in question, you're showing that you are putting yourself over the word of God. Now, the virgin birth, there is no compromise on this for a Christian. And I'm going to tell you why. That you would have to live in cognitive dissonance if you say you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you don't believe in the virgin birth. And it's in your, in your bulletins there. It affects your doctrine of scripture. It affects our view of the world. And it affects who the person of Jesus Christ is. And this is why there is no compromise on the virgin birth. First, the doctrine of Scripture. As I said, saving faith brings with it a heart that says, I will believe, help my unbelief. And if you don't believe the virgin birth, which is clearly taught in Scripture, as I read in Matthew's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel, then what else don't you believe that the Bible is going to teach? 
It means you don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. You don't believe in the inspiration of Scripture. And then but what, on what basis do you believe that Jesus saved you? It's a house of cards. The theological liberals are right. You pull that one out, the rest will fall. You know, you don't have to understand a doctrine to believe a doctrine. We need some humility here. I don't understand gravity, but I believe in it. And by the way, when a parent tells a kid something, don't they believe it even though they don't understand it? For instance, those little sockets in the wall, that has enough power to blow this place up, and it's just sitting there peacefully. And my parents told me, you can plug something in, you can plug your radio into it, and it will peacefully operate that radio, but don't stick your finger in it. Now, I believed them, even though I didn't understand it, and I didn't ever stick my finger in a socket. Now, some of y'all didn't believe your parents, and you faced the consequences. See, you're not absolved from the consequences of the truth just because you don't believe them. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? There is so much in here I don't understand. I know a lot of you guys, you don't understand things, and you ask me, and then, and then you're kind of surprised sometimes that I don't have the answers, and I'm, I, I know I don't understand them, but I believe them because I believe my Father. Okay? So our doctrine of Scripture, it affects our view of the world. What is your view of this world? The naturalists, the materialists, this is a closed system. Nothing can enter it from the outside. It has to operate by the laws of physics and biology and chemistry and all that. To the Christian, we believe, yes, God has created this and given us secondary causes. He's the primary cause that allows the world to operate with regularity. But he, at any moment in time, can intervene. It's not that he's just present in the world. He is. But he's present outside the world. And so it affects your view of the world. If you think that because, naturally speaking, a woman can't conceive without their being a sperm and an egg, then you are, start, it's circular reasoning. You're starting with the view that nothing from can happen that's unnatural. There's no such thing as supernatural. And then you're coming to your, you know, Christians are accused of being, of having circular logic. But the naturalists have the circular logic too. They start with the idea that this is a natural world with nothing supernatural, and then that way, anything supernatural that happens, they say didn't happen. What is your view of the world? I hope... It's a bigger view that allows for the creator who made this beautiful place with sunsets and sunrises and streams and creeks and temperature that feels nice to the skin and birds singing music. I hope your view of the world is big enough that you recognize that there's a creator outside all this that made it and he made it in such a way so that we can enjoy it. Because I don't have enough faith to think this happened on its own. But most importantly, and this is the truth, it's the person of Jesus Christ. And the virgin birth explains two things that I'm not saying God couldn't have done it a different way. I don't know. I don't have that kind of wisdom. But I will say, humanly speaking, these two things only make sense in the virgin birth. And the first is the sinlessness of Christ. Jesus Christ was a human in every respect except without sin. He was tempted in every way except without sin. He had no original sin. The Bible is clear that we are born with the guilt of Adam. It's passed on to us. And yet here's a man, the only one, who does not have that guilt in and of himself. How could that be possible if he was born through the line of Adam. And so the sinlessness of Christ makes sense in the context of a virgin birth. Because when the Bible says that all have sinned in Adam and the seed of the man, well, Christ wasn't born of the seed of a man. Now, this also makes sense along the lines of this, of the prophecy in the garden. You know the prophecy in the garden? 
Whenever we talk about the heritage of a human in the Bible, it's always based on the father, right? It's always the father, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and it's, it's the son David. Jesus is the son of David. But yet in the garden, the promise is, when, Jesus, when God, uh, God tells the serpent after the fall, I will put enmity, strife, there will be an eternal conflict that will end, but... So it's not eternal, but uh, between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Now, the Bible often translates that as offspring because the word seed is, is, is used for offspring. But the seed, is, the seed comes from the man. And yet, the, the prophecy is the seed of the woman. That's the only time you're going to see that in Scripture. It's mind-blowing and remarkable, and a little, the book of Genesis, those first three chapters have all these nuggets that we miss, because he's not going to be from the seed of a man. The Holy Spirit will conceive him. How that works, I don't know, but he made everything. He could do that. So the sinlessness of Christ, which is your only hope. Because that's how we get the active obedience of Jesus Christ. The passive obedience is that he submits to saving us. But the active obedience is he perfectly obeys the law. How could he do that if he had sin? And so the virgin birth gives us an explanation of that. that, so, So I said, the person of Jesus Christ, the two doctrines about him that the virgin birth perfectly explains that without, I'm not sure how it would work, his sinlessness, the second one is his two natures. He has a divine nature and a human nature. If Jesus was the actual physical son of Joseph and Mary, he would only have a human nature. You understand? So divinity had to to touch humanity. Heaven had to touch earth. The virgin birth is beautiful. The clear teaching of Scripture is that Jesus is God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So you say, well, yeah, that's God. Yeah. And then it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we get introduced to Jesus Christ. Human and divine. Colossians 1, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Colossians 1 is reflecting a reflection of John 1. The creator comes and it's the image of God. Hebrews 1, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. This is not a closed system, this world. It's being upheld by one who transcends it and yet one who entered it. You're confused? Praise God. You want a God you can figure out? This goes back to Ahaz, this faithless, worthless, wicked, horrible, disgusting human being. And Jesse knows where I'm going. Because he's just showing on the outside what a what exists in each of us. It's why Paul says, Jesus Christ came to save sinners of whom I am the greatest. Was Paul the greatest sinner? He recognized in himself his wickedness. In other words, we don't have, we are not firm in faith. And we do fear. We do let our heart be faint. What's going on in this Ahaz thing is going on in each human. 
that when trouble comes, we look to self-saving techniques. And that's usually by trying to get somebody to fix our problem or doing it ourselves. And I'll resort to God when, 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 when I last minute because if I have to walk with God, then that's relationship. And in a relationship, then he can ask things of me. And so Jesus had to come in the virgin birth. God had to enter time and space into the womb of a young lady who was so overjoyed by it. Heaven kissed earth to make it right for us. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. You want a sign from traitors? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. See, this is the last, the last point of the sermon, and this is, this is the hope. Like, I've, I've, I've spoke somewhat intellectually, transcendent, imminent, two natures of Christ, lots of doctrines, materialism. How does this affect you? And me, Emmanuel, God with us. God has to do it. And what's being said here is you want to keep God at a distance and only call him in at a last resort maybe. But God wants to be with you. And that's why the virgin birth is connected to God with us. Because God comes in the flesh. He knows we're weak. We want to see him, and we could never see him. He would eviscerate us. And yet that was Moses' heart as he's walking with the, show me your glory. Jesus Christ is the image and the glory of God. When, it, when the, Nathan or one of the disciples asked Jesus, show us the Father, and Jesus says, how could you be with me this long? And If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. We shall behold him. But Emmanuel is not just a future hope. It is. I mean, that's how the book of Revelation ends, right? Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. That was what the the Exodus was supposed to be, right? Deliver the people to be with, and God's like, these people are stiff-necked. I'm not going with you. And Moses says, no, you have to go with us. We don't want to go if you don't go with us. And so we're waiting for that time when he's, when he's with us. But the teaching of the Bible is he is with us. Do you experience the presence of God with you now? We live like we don't. But I know he's here. I feel him. The same way I am a descendant of Adam and I inherited all his junk and was probably far worse than him after that, I inherit the spirit of Christ who lives inside me. And I try to live life so often like he's not. And I was talking with a bunch of pastors this week. I have a group of pastors uh, in different states that we talk, we pray, we, and we, we could be real vulnerable with one another. And we were just sharing struggles throughout the year. And, and, and yet, like every struggle we shared, it was like, but God, but God. And I said, isn't it amazing how the trials and the struggles come into our lives? And, and those are the times when we experience Emmanuel. He's with us. It's not that we have a problem and suddenly he shows up. He is with you. If you are in him. One pastor friend, um, he, he had a, they just had a baby this year. They have really good health insurance, supposedly. And the hospital bill ended up being, they, what they owed was going to be like $10,000 after everything, you know. And he's like, how could I owe $10,000? That wasn't the deductible or whatever. The insurance company said, well, you didn't get that, that, that birth approved. He said, what? He said, I've gone, I've, we've got, we've had OBGYN appointments. We've had ultrasounds. We've had, it's our doctor who you've paid all the bills. What do you mean? Because I didn't call you before when the wife was in labor. Nobody can understand it. 
And so he's fighting with the hospital, not the hospital yet, but the hospital, the insurance company, and they will not pay this bill. He didn't know what he's going to do. An elder comes up to him the other day, and I don't think the congregation knows about this. An elder comes up to him the other day and says, somebody wants to give you an anonymous gift. He opens it up. It was from the church because they must have given it through the church or so. I don't know. $10,000. The man, this, this burly guy was crying as he was telling us, and we see the video messages. You know, He wasn't crying because he got $10,000. He wasn't. That, was, that wasn't what he said at all. God was with him. God was with him. We feel alone and nothing. God feeds the birds. How much more will he not care for his children? This is Emmanuel. And this is my hope for us as we celebrate busy times and a busy season and chaos and craziness. And it's like the little baby in a manger. He's not only with you today and tomorrow. He's not only going to be with you in the future. He's with you. Tap into him every day. Walk by the Spirit. Feel the peace that passes all understanding. That's the peace of Christ with you. (laughs) Praise God. God came down and touched his creation in the virgin birth. He's Emmanuel, God with us. Is he with you? If not, you're missing out. But he says, all who believe in him, John's gospel says, he gave the right to be called children of God. Would you place your faith in Christ today? Let's pray.